The job of the neural link implant device that's challenging, but I think they're going to overcome, is to create a chip that can take all of that information, lots and lots and lots of information, and translate it into neural signals dynamically in real time. Because people don't just look at their hand moving in front of their face for 10 minutes. But I'm confident they're going to succeed in doing this because all the necessary components are known. That's critical. Does that mean that you could also put in a signal of something that never happened that's complete fantasy? Oh, yeah. It looks like it's possible that Neuralink is going to help blind people see again. Is that is there any truth behind that? Yes, there is. So this is an area I know a lot about. Um, I've watched Neuralink develop what they're doing, not at a level of detail, you know, where I could speak to the specific engineering, but a guy that came up through my lab, he worked actually at Stanford, but did a little bit of time in my lab, a guy named Matt McDougall, he's a medical doctor, neurosurgeon. He's the lead neurosurgeon at Neuralink. Um, so here's what they're doing there. They're using small implantable devices to stimulate neurons and or record from neurons. This is really powerful because if you can record from neurons and get a sense of what their patterns of firing are in a healthy individual, then you could potentially put those same patterns of firing into a brain or an eye of a patient who is somehow suffering from not enough or not proper neural activity in that particular region. Okay, And they've got a bunch of other things they're doing that are really cool, like using robotics to get really precise and really fast about the implant of these chips so that you don't have to do neurosurgery the way it's traditionally done. They're building a ton of amazing biomedical tools related to robotics and AI in addition. Okay, here's the part about blindness. There are a lot of different forms of blindness. There are forms of blindness caused by loss of the photoreceptive cells, that is the cells that convert light into electrical signals that then are passed into the brain, okay? So there are a number of diseases where photoreceptor loss occurs. There you need to put back in a light sensing tissue or device, okay? There are also forms of blindness like, for instance, glaucoma, which is a degeneration of neurons called retinal ganglion cells. They line the back of your eye. These are actually brain neurons. They're central nervous system neurons. And they send these little connections that we call axons, which are like little wires, into the brain to allow transmission of visual images so you can see visual perception. And of course, there are forms of blindness that occur because the visual cortex is damaged, the area deep within the brain. So what Neuralink is doing quite rationally is they're figuring out, hey, we have little implantable devices that can stimulate and simulate the patterns of neural activity that occur in normal healthy neurons that allow normal healthy people to see. So they've been recording these patterns of activity. And mind you, there have been researchers within the field of visual neuroscience like E.J. Chicholnitsky at Stanford and others who have been doing this for a long time. But Neuralink is gaining really good ground on this problem of measuring what are the patterns of firing in these neurons that normally occur when light comes into the eye and what sorts of patterns of activity are transmitted deeper into the brain by these retinal ganglion cells. What sorts of patterns of activity occur within the brain when that activity comes in that gives rise to, say, the perception of my hand moving in front of my face, which is what I'm doing now for anyone just listening. So what they're doing is they're taking perceptual events like motion, color, face recognition, et cetera, figuring out what patterns of neural activity are required, and then going into the broken visual system of a human who perhaps lacks retinal ganglion cells or perhaps has damage in a particular region of their visual cortex, and introducing the healthy patterns of activity by simply replaying those patterns of activity at the right location along the visual pathway. Wow. Now, this is wild because there have been very few instances one in particular by a guy named Botan Roska and Carl Dyseroth, one of whom is in Switzerland, the other at Stanford, of restoring light sensitivity to the photoreceptors and allowing a blind patient, this was done in one patient, a blind patient to be able to see crude light and dark object formations within their visual environment. So this is not restoration of precise vision. Okay. Okay. What Neuralink is trying to do, as far as I understand, is something far more precise to figure out the exact patterns of activity that are required to create visual scenes, to create motion perception, to create face perception, 
and then put a tiny implantable device at the location in the brain where it's needed most. Could be within the eye, but more technically, it's going to be done within the deeper brain, okay? Areas like the thalamus, the visual cortex, for those that want to know, and essentially allow then a device within the eye, because this can be done, right? Even if someone's lacking eye tissue, to see the visual world, right? Because a, a camera can see the visual world. And then give that information to the device, which then can translate the digital image into a neural signal that then can speak to the rest of the neurons in the visual system. Holy shit. So the reason I say yes, they are very likely to succeed in doing this, and I think they got FDA approval. I know they got FDA approval, at least for the first pass at this, first pass attempt in humans, is that all the components that you need are there. You know what the visual scene is. You can put a camera where the eye is. You can even have eyeglasses with just a camera, a little wire going in through the temporal bone, right? Just glasses, a little wire right there. Maybe even a contact lens with a little wire. This is now possible. Then that wire takes the visual image that's received digitally, like an image on a phone, right? If you think about the little camera on a phone, it's not much bigger than an eyeball um, circumference. And then provide the electrical signals, the digital signals, that is, to the chip that they can provide the electrical signals to the neurons that then create the proper neural signals. They've essentially decoded visual processing and they can introduce whatever component happens to be missing in that patient. So if the patient has photoreceptors and ganglion cells, but is lacking a patch of neurons in the visual system because of damage or what have you, a stroke, they could replace the signals that would have originated from those neurons. If they're lacking ganglion cells, they can replace those signals. If they're lacking photoreceptors, that's a little bit trickier, but you could use a camera that views the outside world, right? The camera has perfectly good photoreception. Just make sure that it's translating the camera video image into the proper neural image. Wow. So they are pursuing this. It makes very good sense as to why this would be the first thing that Neuralink should pursue in terms of brain augmentation and re restoration of function because the visual system has this important property, which is that you know what the inputs are that you want to deliver to the chip. Compare that, for instance, to like um, a memory, right? I'll walk out of here after this recording, I'll have a memory of it. Let's say I had brain damage and I lost my memories. What neural signals would you give the brain in order to recreate this experience? Hmm. You don't know. With visual images, you know all the statistics of the visual scene, right? How light or dark something is, the spatial frequency, meaning just the spacing between things, right? You know how high contrasty or low contrasty it is. And you can basically get all that through a quality digital image and then just feed it to the chip. The job of the neural link implant device that's challenging, but I think they're going to overcome, is to create a chip that can take all of that information, lots and lots and lots of information, and translate it into neural signals dynamically in real time. Because people don't just look at their hand moving in front of their face for 10 minutes. They're looking at that, then they're putting it down, then they're walking this way. There's optic flow, there's stuff going by. But I'm confident they're going to succeed in doing this because all the necessary components are known, that's critical. Right? We don't know all the necessary inputs that are required to like create a memory of your grandmother. We just don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. right? But we do know all the necessary physical world components coming in. We know what needs to be encoded by the camera. That's easy to do with a camera. Cameras are very small now. How to feed that to a chip that then can translate it into the language of the nervous system, which is electrical signals driven by chemical release from neurons. Does that mean that you could also put in a signal of something that never happened that's complete fantasy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, in fact, there was an experiment that was done by uh, two guys, Bill Newsom and Tony Movshin and others, the following way. And they did this in a macaque monkey. You put a small microstimulator into an area of the brain that reads out what the, not the stimulator, this area of the brain pays attention to whether or not things are moving up, down, or to the side in the visual world. You have this area in your brain. If I were to put an electrode in there and record and move some things up, certain neurons would fire, others wouldn't. Certain neurons would fire to down, certain neurons to, to left, certain neurons to right. They've actually done the experiment where they train this animal to view dots moving in a particular direction, and then to basically correspond with a lever press or a joystick to say which, which direction that it's moving. And if you reward animals for getting the answer right, pretty soon they learn how to do this. They did an experiment many years ago now where they put a little microstimulation 
in this brain area where they had the monkey see dots going down and the monkey pulls the joystick down saying the dots are going down. Then they decide to stimulate the neurons that were active during the dots going down perceptual decision of the monkey while the dots are going up. So they move dots up and the monkey thinks that the dots are going down, okay? They basically are tinkering with the activity in the brain so that even though the animal can perceive what's happening in the environment, it thinks that the opposite is happening, right? Yeah. So dots are going up, but they're stimulating the neurons in the brain that have led in the past to the perceptual decision that the dots are moving down. And the monkey only does this, and the neurons only fire when the dots are moving. So they know it's not just the monkey anticipating this or something. So dots are going up now and the monkey goes, they're going down, they're going down. Why does it think they're going down? Because they're stimulating the neurons in the brain that they make it think that the dots are going down. Now, it seems profound, but on the face of it, it kind of had to be that way. And so these things of stimulating different brain areas, you know, we get to this because when you stimulate a brain area, it doesn't really matter what's happening in the outside world. And this is why Neuralink is so interesting, exciting, and a little bit scary for us yeah. to think about it, which is that if I put a little chip into the area of your brain that causes rage, like a little patch of zona inserta, or the mid-thalamus, there's certain nuclei there where you can generate some pretty aggressive behavior, or I were to stimulate an area of the brain that's associated with depression, like the habenula, or an area of the brain that's associated with inhibiting the habenula, you could potentially remove some components of depression, wow. encourage rage, discourage rage. All of this is possible because ultimately all of our behavior and thought processes come through these little neural hubs and these neural circuits. So what Neuralink is doing is developing ways to get in there and push on specific types of perceptions and behaviors, emotions and memories in ways that are completely unprecedented. But it is 100% possible and it is 100% happening first in the visual system. Wow. So you could... You could project 100% of a false reality into somebody's head and, and they think that, that it is all actually happening. Definitely. Wow, that is, uh, that's mind control. It is mind control. No matter where you're watching Sean Ryan show from, if you get anything out of this, please like, comment, subscribe, and most importantly, share this everywhere you possibly can. And if you're feeling extra generous, Please leave us a review on Apple and Spotify podcasts.